All right. That was a lot of fun. Wonderfully made. We're so wonderfully made. What a fun song and, and true song that our kids learned this week at VBS. And, and because we have a wonderful God who's made us so wonderfully as we just sung in that VBS song, I want us all before go before our great and wonderful God in prayer before we open up his word together. Would you pray with me, church? Father, we thank you that you made us wonderfully made because you're our wonderful God. Thank you for the truths that we learned this past week in VBS. Pray that you would imprint those truths on the hearts of every student who was there, everyone who learned and sung songs like that, that that they would believe that and know that and be encouraged by that. And I just pray the the same for everybody else who's here as well. Would you help us to see what your word reveals? Would you help us to turn away from unbiblical thinking as it relates to how you made us, Lord? And help us, even as we see from the scriptures again, open our eyes, move our hearts, and, and, and bless us today with the consideration of your word. We say this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we come now to the second half of Psalm 139 to pick up where we left off last Sunday. Uh, For those of you who were here, the first half of Psalm 139. And then for those of you who've been serving all week at VBS, thank you for your faithfulness, uh, putting in some wonderful hours this past week to, to evangelize, to disciple, and to use your gifts for the blessing of the, the students that, are, that were here with us. This whole theme of Psalm 139 uh, and, and the realities of, the, of sanctity of life and the value of life has been su- stuff that we've been learning about, singing really fun, catchy songs that you all were able to get caught up on today, discussing in our classes, even playing wonderful games uh, uh, out, out in the, the grass related to uh, being created in God's image, and, and even eating certain snacks that reminded us that we are wonderfully made all this week. This is a, a continued theme right here where we're at as a church. What a blessing. And isn't Psalm 139 majestic? H.C. Lupold rightly says, the psalm throbs with warm emotion and deep feeling. Do you get that when you read it, when you study it? And Charles Spurgeon put it like this, in the most forcible manner, it shows God's eye has always rested on us and is resting on us now. Oh, I'm so glad that we're dealing with Psalm 139 for a second week, that we get another week with it, because these are important truths. And we've already seen the last time that we were wonderfully made by a wonderful God, a God who is all-knowing, a God who is everywhere present, even in hard places, in difficult circumstances, in sufferings, in trials, in sin. He's everywhere present with us. And he's also all powerful. John Phillips wrote this about Psalm 139. He said, the psalmist realized he was in touch with an omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent God. He says, nowhere else in scripture does the Holy Spirit give us such a detailed exposition of these three essential attributes of God. And we saw that clearly last week, and we're going to continue to see that this week as well. And as we saw before, even last week, Derek Kidner pointed us to the fact that small thoughts of God are eradicated by this psalm. That's the purpose of Psalm 139 and all of Scripture, to get out of our minds tiny, puny, small thoughts of God. And the famous hymn writer John Wesley even said that this psalm is by many of the Jewish doctors esteemed the most excellent in the whole book. What a great God. We are wonderfully made. Alexander McLaren gets at the heart of why I think this psalm is so beloved for all of us. And it was so beloved for King David. This is why. He says, 
the thought that God knows him, or knows David, through and through blends in the singer's mind with the other, that God surrounds him on every side. Isn't that encouraging to know that God is there with you and for you, and he knows it all? Oh, what a glorious reality. And, and the New American Commentary, which is a well-known Southern Baptist set of commentaries, reminds us of exactly what we saw last week, and it's this. Listen to this. It says, the Lord did not have to wait until the psalmist's birth, to know all about him. His knowledge doesn't just start when someone's born. No, he didn't have to wait. He didn't have to wait. For his eyes saw the psalmist even in his embryonic state. All the days of his life were planned and recorded in advance by the Lord even before he emerged from the womb. What a great thought. What a great God. Even John Calvin, who wrote several hundred years before all this, he says this, the embryo, when first conceived in the womb, has no form. And David speaks of God, God's having known him when he was yet a shapeless mass. The argument is from the greater to the lesser. If he was known to God beforehand, before he had grown to the certain definite shape, much less could he now elude his observation. He knows us from the beginning through our whole life. What a powerful and personal God that we serve. I want us to be encouraged by that, just as we've been encouraged at VBS this past week. It reminds us once again what's at stake in the the, the current abortion debate that we discussed a little bit last week and what has always been at stake before and after Roe versus Wade. This has always been at stake. And this is the fact that the intentional destroying of innocent human image bearers of God for the sake of many unbiblical excuses in our day is what is at stake. The image of God is at stake. Parents in abortion who are intentionally eradicated, their offspring, this is an unthinkable thing that's before us and we are reminded as we look at Psalm 139 just how really unbiblical and and horrific it it really is. And on that note, we will be continuing our series next week to address this very topic of abortion and specifically abortion worldviews. What leads someone to take a a pro-choice or a pro-life position? As we will build off of the teaching on Psalm 139, there's so much more to be said, and, and, and this is why being able to continue to dive into this is going to be so important for us, because we live in a really crazy world that, that thinks crazy things, and, 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 and even if you are convinced of the biblical view of Psalm 139, how many of us have had conversations with family members and coworkers and neighbors and others who have had different views. We want to be able to have answers. We want to be able to point people towards just what is, what is true and praiseworthy and biblically because we care about this very, very important uh, human issue in terms of what God has revealed in his word. If you look in your bulletins, check in your bulletins, there's a, maybe you've already noticed it, there's a little piece of paper there that, that has an opportunity for you to anonymously write any questions that you may have personally yourself. You may disagree with our church and our doctrine and the Bible on these things, and you may have uh, objections. You could anonymously write a question or bring something up there, and and you can put it uh, in the back for, for me to see. Or if you've had questions from family members and friends and just things that you've been thinking through as you've been watching the news the last few weeks after the, the Dobbs decision, um, I want to be able to examine all those things as I continue to, to dive in and seek to help our church to better think through the biblical world and life view as it relates to the sanctity of life. I thank you in advance. If you write anything, it will help our series. It'll help our church. So any feedback that you could provide would be a blessing. But even with this really wonderful biblical world and life view that we've been seeing from Psalm 139, Some Christians are still sadly confused on the topic. I'm reminded again, even this past week, I've had conversations with with people, and so we want to be able to to, to really dive into these things. And many people, and then many even professing Christians, don't quite seem to live in light of the wonderful realities that we've been seeing in Psalm 139. 
And, and I think it's just a tragedy. I don't want that for anybody here in this room. As Phillips put it, we are the objects of his or God's constant care and concern. We see that in Psalm 139, right? His thoughts are towards us more than the grains of the sand on all the world's seashores. How sad that so few people in this world ever come to realize that, he says. Isn't that sad? He says, how criminal are those godless systems of philosophy which rob us of this comfort and which also rob God of our appreciation and love of him. Oh, there's a, there's a lot at stake. And even if you're here and, and you denounce abortion yourself and you're thinking, hey, Daniel, we live in a state here in Missouri that doesn't have an abortion clinic anymore and, and, and that, that's not really a, an issue as much around here. I don't know why you're making such a big deal about this. But because human image bearers are at stake, the more that I've thought about this, the more that I've realized how weighty it is. And I think Christians have an answer, have a direction to help people that are so confused on this topic. But then also, Psalm 139 and what we've been seeing, even if you agree with the biblical view that all life is, is meaningful and wonderful and purposeful from conception uh, to birth throughout the whole life, my question for you is, are your thoughts regularly attuned to the glory of this sovereign and powerful God in your daily life. This is important for all of us to consider. Or consider the question that Christopher Ash asks, which is similar to that. This is what he says. Are you, think about this, say to yourself, am I, are you consciously, moment by moment, living life in the presence of God? Are you conscious about that? And he admits, too often I am not. And he says that the reformers used the Latin phrase, corum Deo, to describe this idea. He said that this psalm will help us learn to live like this, and it will make all the difference in our lives. And as we saw last week, that we were wonderfully made, and we're going to be turning now and seeing this week that we're fearfully made, I want us to learn to live in light of the presence of God, or corum Deo. Day by day, moment by moment. This leads us to our texts now, texts to address this specifically into point number one and, and fearful creation that we're going to see from Psalm 139 and verses 14 through 18. Look with me at Psalm 139 and verse 14 for this. David says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Church, I want us to realize how wonderfully and fearfully made that we really are. Think of the faith, mystery, and awe that King David had before his God to take it on faith, all the nuances of God's wonderful creation before even the scientific era where we learn so much more about our biology and development. Think about it. He's saying all this before we've learned so much historically. Back then, David never saw an ultrasound image in the womb. Never. That wouldn't come out until recently in history. Yet David praised God and knew even back then that obviously there was human life growing in the depths of the earth and in the darkness, which was a way of referring, the language there was a way of referring to the unknown mystery of the mother's womb. Darkness. It's mysterious to David. Back then, all you can see without an ultrasound was the skin or the belly of the mother's stomach growing, and you couldn't see anything inside, right? And yet David knew and took comfort in the fact 
that God knew what was going on behind the skin of his mother's stomach and every other mother's stomach. He knew because he knew that God is God and has that amazing knowledge. His knowledge and presence was there and intimately involved and providential over the details of his preborn life in the dark of the womb. The womb, like I said, is likened to the depth of the earth because of the fearful mystery of it all. Now, fast forward to today, we have technology, don't we? To be able to, to see the weaving together and the majestic aspects of God's plan and wonderful purpose of the development of a preborn baby in his or her mother's womb. I was reminded while meditating on this passage this past week that Stacy and I got our first 3D picture with our sixth and most recent child and son, Noah. We, we never had a 3D image. In the past, we had just got you know the black and white images and vid- video at the ultrasound. We were able to see um, all of the other ones, but this was the first time that we went and it got the 3D image. We were just, you know, we never tried it. We thought we'd go and, and get that. It was really interesting. And let me just say this, church. It was quite anticlimactic when it came to the gender reveal. We got the 3D pictures of Noah's face before we were even able to see the ultrasound proof of his gender. It was just his face. And let's just say the profile of his face that we saw revealed that Stacy and I were looking at a little baby boy. I mean, he looked just like his dad. We're looking at him. The girls were a little hopeful as they were hoping for a little baby sister, of course. And all of them were like, they look, look at the picture and they're like, well, maybe. I mean, hopefully they were, they were acting like they were still maybe hopeful that it would be a, a little girl. But they knew by just looking at the picture, it was so detailed that this was a, a little masculine baby boy face that we're looking at. And as we found out the gender weeks or a month later, whenever it was, we kind of already knew it beforehand. Because of the amazing technology, we all know now what we're looking at inside the mother's womb is an image-bearing human being being knit together in an amazing way. It's so clear. Isn't it amazing what we can see in the womb? There's no question about what God is doing and what is going on. And all the nuances of the intricate day-by-day development of a child in the womb can only be surprised by both the, the word wonderful and also fearful as we are humbled and amazed at the handiwork of the miraculous God, powerful creator God. His wisdom and his power, God's creativity, this intricate care from conception to birth and everything in between, it takes our breath away if we just think about it a little bit. Mankind, you see, has invented and thought up a lot of great things in the history of the world. But nothing, I tell you, comes close to the detail and beauty and wonder of the development of life. And God is the one who created and invented it. It's amazing. Those who have read books like What to Expect When You're Expecting are reminded about the wonder of this day by day, week by week, as you're learning how big your, your preborn child is and all the different development. And we realize that this is true, just as David realized it was true before the ultrasound even. He knows that God is able to see and create and know us even back then. And as R.C. Sproul and others have pointed out, Um, embryologists have confirmed that at conception a completely unique human being exists in embryo form with its own DNA and then he goes on to talk about this and he says after about two weeks there's a heartbeat with their own blood that are able to identify separate from the mother's and after only about six weeks the preborn baby is only the size of a peanut but has distinct fingers and hands. And at only 43 days, you can track, at that point, detectable brain waves, and the baby is already moving in the womb at about six and a half weeks, even before the mother could feel it because the baby is so small. At nine weeks, the preborn baby has its unique set of fingerprints. A kidneys are formed and functioning, and you can even identify the baby's gender at this time. Sproul says, and I quote, by the end of the 10th week, 
the gallbladder is functioning. And then all the organs of the body are functioning by the end of the 12th week. And the baby can cry. All this is accomplished during the first few months, three months of pregnancy. And I might add, this is about the time that many people decide to abort and kill their preborn a child. It's terrible. Whenever abortion happens, it's terrible. But just you see, even in those few months, the wonder of God's handiwork. It's a kind of disbelief because of our puny minds can have nothing in comparison to the wisdom of God. We're just like, wow, it's a fearful creation. We know and should have a healthy fear and awe of God and His mysterious knowledge, His wonderful might, and His great power. Do you awe and fear God? One way that proves this in our day and age, and there's many different ways, is how you treat his wonderful creation. If you demean and diminish human life by being just indifferent and okay with abortion, you're just really showing that you don't fear God. There is no fear of God before your eyes, as the Bible has said about other biblical characters. No fear. And it also reveals that you're missing out on the sovereign purposes and plan of God for each human being that is wonderfully and specially made by God. Made by God, of course, using in his plan the biological means of mothers and fathers in his perfect creation of us just as God has intended. It should cause us to worship and be in awe of him. And we, in terms of our humanity, have the nerve to intervene and abort and kill life with violent means to stop what God fearfully created. Oh, it's unthinkable. I ask, along with Francis Schaeffer and his title of his book, whatever happened to the human race? It's unthinkable that we would get so nonchalant and careless about the amazing human life and value and dignity. How can we have stooped so low as to discard what God called good and wonderful and fearfully made? This is an important issue for all of us, our hearts to be going out to. And notice also that God has a purpose for you before you were even born. Did you notice that in the passage? While you were in the womb even. But he also, the passage tells us, has mapped out the purpose of every single day of your life all the way into, until your death, as verse 16 tells us. Let's see that and get a little bit excited about this wonderful creator and his wonderful creation. It's fearful to know that there's a God who does this perfectly. He says, your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet... There was none of them, even before you were born. He had this plan for you from beginning uh, until end. Do you see that? Do you see that David is showing us that God has a perfect plan and knowledge of your life? Not only does he know everything in the womb, as we've already been seeing here through this passage, but he knows and plans our entire lives out of the womb. Our days were planned by God. Now, some sarcastic skeptic might say, well, doesn't that mean that God knew all those 60 plus million babies that would be aborted post row? Well, yes, of course, God knows all things, including the life and death of each of those who were even killed, murdered, before they even saw the light of day terminated in the womb. But it does not justify this unflinching murder of the pre-born babies. God knows about all kinds of evil, doesn't he? But it does not justify that said evil. He doesn't condone it by any means. But I want us to be comforted by this reality here. This exhaustive knowledge and plan of God, even of your future days. God knows your life, every one of our lives. He knows your span of life. It's not lost on him. He knew you before anyone else could even see you when you were just 
early unformed human life and he knew you then and knows your life. Be comforted by the God who knows you personally. He knows the numbers of your days. He knows the hairs on your head. He formed you, he knows you, he has a plan for you. So even as I encouraged all the children in VBS this past week, I want us to do the same that they did this past week. And I want us to look to our right and look to our left, just as all the kiddos did. And I want you to say to the people that are next to you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderfully made, brother. Say it. Look and say it. It's true. It's true about every. It was true about the kids this past week. It's true about you. He knows you. He formed you from first to last. God has your days numbered. And his hands are on them. He can see. He was there. He knew when you were conceived. And he knows the day you die. Be encouraged by that. Praise God for that. Trust God with that. All you can do after thinking about this wonderful creator and his wonderful creation is exclaim with David in verses 17 through 18 and look at it and feel the wonder of it all as he says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still With you, amazing, fearfully, wonderfully made. And this leads us now to our second point. You know, we've seen here that we are God's fearful creation. Now we move on to number two, fearful judgment. Turn with me in your Bibles or look on the screen to verses 19 through 22. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Now you might be thinking here, wait, 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 wait. Hold on a minute there, pastor. What happened to my beloved Psalm 139 that we are so familiar with? We've gone from the high and exalted thoughts of God and man now to the destruction of God's enemies through God's judgment and vengeance against them. Where in the world, you might be thinking, has my sweet and wonderful Psalm gone that I know so well? I don't remember this back reading it in the past. And we know all the other parts of the psalm so clearly, but for some reason, these verses have ended up uh, not on our top priority for bumper stickers, right? Not on our top priority to frame and put in our homes. Uh, This is just something that hits us and maybe strikes us as a little bit odd. And I get that. Because we live in a day and age that, that so emphasizes its own made-up version of God and God's love, and it's just punted, hasn't it, on the issue of judgment. We're not used to thinking about those types of things. But even as the, the Lutheran Study Bible or the Evangelical Heritage Study Bible uh, puts it, hear, hear what it says. It's helpful. It says, God's attribute of love does not set aside his attribute of holiness. The same loving God who forgives sins will continue to be the holy God who punishes unforgiven sin through all eternity. Did you hear that? We have to have a full picture of God. There's a biblical view that's different than what we oftentimes think of. And since not all people worship and praise and glorify God, right? Even though everyone, every human being should be worshiping God, praising God. We know that that's just not the case. Not everybody does. And some even curse God directly, blatantly, unrepentantly. And there are those who are not worshipers of God, at least at this moment right now, and and while they remain in that state, they are enemies of God, the Bible reveals to us. Now, it's true that everyone in this room If you're a believer, this is true of you, that we were at one time 
enemies of God prior to our conversions. You know that the book of Romans tells us that we were enemies of God. We didn't know him and trust him and believe him. But now if you're a believer, you have trusted Jesus Christ and the gospel for your salvation, so that transfers you from being his enemy to being his friend because of what he has done in your life. And so maybe it describes you right now, you may be in this room and you may right now be an enemy of God. And if you're an unbeliever, the scriptures say you're an enemy of God. And believers, rather than siding with and condoning the sinful, God-hating and opposing enemies of God in the world, we must get with God's program and how we view the world, or as the new Bible commentary helpfully counsels us, listen to what this resource helps us with. It says, if these verses shock, and maybe you were shocked by them, maybe you've been shocked when you've come across verses like that. It says, if these verses shock, the fault is more likely in us. Were we not under threat as David was, we would better appraise his words. But deeper than we are in suffering, even deeper than that, he was also higher in holiness. God was higher in holiness. To side with God is to identify with the totality of his revealed character and ways. I think that's what this section of the passage is bringing out. We must side with God against his enemies. We don't want to play nice and simply affirm or nicely say that we think it's just great however anyone lives and whatever they do. We're just kind of, oh, it's wonderful. We're just going to, you know, affirm everybody's, you know, right to choose this or that evil, uh, even if it's in opposition to God. No, we need to think clearly about these things, and we need to treat, as the passage says, the bloodthirsty, blatant enemies of God, not as indifferent bystanders, innocent bystanders out there, but because they're enemies of God. And we need to see that and, and connect that. It's interesting that this phrase, uh, bloodthirsty or men of blood in, in this way, it's interesting if we just traced out the connotations of that kind of thing throughout human history. Am I right? There have always been murderers throughout history, and there were even infant murderers recorded in the Bible. If you recall, the infanticide of the Jewish boys in the Exodus uh, of Moses in, in that time period, and, and that Moses had to be saved by being put into a basket so that he would not be drowned in the water. Do you remember? That's recorded in Scripture. Or the boys around Jesus' age that the evil King Herod sought out to destroy one by one and to murder them. It's infanticide. It's, it's killing children and babies. It's bloodthirsty. We can go all the way back into the Old Testament and the, the slaying of children was a practice of worship in, in the idol Moloch and this idol idolatry and worship. We can see examples of that. This has been happening throughout history in a variety of different ways, but even on this specific topic, we've seen it from the beginning. And then we turn to our current day and the millions upon millions of preborn untold babies that were sacrificed in the womb in the history of our world. It's devastating. Escalated, of course, at row after row in the last 50 years, but it was, it was legal in some states before, don't forget it. Even though, and it, and it happens uh, even today, even after uh, the Dobbs decision, and we pray that this would drastically de decrease and be lessened and become unthinkable, that after this decision, this whole entire thing would just be a distant memory in the past, kind of like we look back at the Holocaust of, of, of Jewish lives that were that were brutally murdered, that we look back and we say, how could anyone have ever put up with that? How could anyone been ever been okay with that? How could we have ever been indifferent and just kind of like, ah, it's not a big deal. Out of sight. I'm a... How could we ever respond in those ways? A biblical worldview doesn't allow it. There's men of blood around us in history and we see it. So I, I think that we need to have a fearful recognition of God's judgment here. And I get, like I said before, that this, a section like this is hard for many to swallow because of how foreign it is to our modern sentiments. I get that. But if we were only more steeped in the Psalms, and as those of you who are going through the Psalm study with 
Jeremy, in the Sunday school class, I think you've been talking about the different genres of psalms, and you're kind of up to speed, those of you who've been in that Sunday school class. We would see how many other sections, even outside of 139, were these, these prayers of imprecatory or imprecatory prayers and the psalmists are actually praying against their enemies. We see how much there actually are in the psalms and throughout scripture and that this one right here on Psalm 139, notice it's actually David aligning with God against God's enemies. So, so that's a good kind of picture, a, a righteous indignation or righteous anger or a righteous view is when we aren't just offended by our own situation, but we're seeing it in light of what God is doing. And so we can have a a righteous assessment and say, this is wrong and this is wrong. Surely we want people to repent and and no longer be enemies of God. We, We can even pray for our enemies and we can love those who persecute us as Jesus teaches on the Sermon on the Mount, but we want to get on God's side and call evil evil. And good, good. And our world, our world calls good evil. And it calls evil good. How many times have you seen evil celebrated? We're just coming off of a month in June where evil is just blatantly celebrated, clear biblical direction and evil in a culture and a world that it's celebrated. And with all that, this issue of abortion is even celebrated. We need to get on God's side here. We need to see what God is revealing. We need to see that there's fearful judgment coming. We can't ignore that. And on this note, I think we should be careful not to approach pridefully or judgmentally everybody in a condemning way, in a prideful way, as we see everyone around us as enemies against God and us. And and we should also kind of have a sense of reality that we should rightly align ourselves, of course, against God's enemies, be open to the repentance and even be open to witness to them. And I want us to see this. I mean, what else? What is the opposite? What else are we to do? Should we say just, I'm just happy with all these enemies of God who are rising up and murderous intent against God and just count them as friends and think, hey, let's just hang out and pretend that everything's okay and good. No, we want to be able to see sharply a biblical understanding about those people because we want them to avoid the fearful judgment that is coming to them if they don't repent. And so ultimately, for those who continue on in their wicked ways, we need to agree with God and say, those ultimate enemies who never become God's friends through conversion, through salvation, if they never repent of their bloodthirsty ways and and never come to Jesus, then they are our enemies too. And we think rightly, biblically, directly, as it relates to that. And, And to be really clear here, enemy sinners, let me emphasize this, do find grace in Christ. You were once an enemy sinner of God. Please know that. You're his friend now because of Jesus. But those who remain enemies and never turn to Jesus will be judged. And we must warn them. We must warn the world of pending judgment. Even as Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness, warned before the flood, we must point to the reality of a future judgment coming that many men and women who never repent and turn to Jesus for salvation will experience that fearful judgment. Praise God, if you're a believer, you're not under the fearful judgment of him because you have Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. But we must be witnesses to the reality of what God has revealed. So warn, align with God against his enemies. But, But here's the thing, don't go too far down that road. Don't get angry and cranky. Not so fast there. You too are a sinner, every one of you, even if you're a believer, saved by the grace of God, and you ought to be honest about that reality, and it should cause you to have a heart of constant self-examination and honesty and humility. I want that for you. And this leads us to our third and final point, and number three, fearful repentance. Look with me at verses 23 to 24, how David thought about things, even in light of his enemies, even in light of God's enemies. What does it say? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. If you remember last week, I mentioned how 
the vast knowledge and presence of God can be a really frightening thing to think about. He's everywhere present and he knows all things, even our thoughts, everywhere we go, everything we do. And it's especially fearful for unbelievers who have not been yet forgiven from their sins, the sins that God knows and sees. For the unbeliever, it's, it's a scary thought. But David Gunderson in, his, uh, newly, in the newly released Grace and Truth Study Bible that's edited by Al Mohler, who is uh, the president of the school that I went to seminary, uh, David Gunderson rightly pointed out that it's somewhat sobering Even, that thought is sobering for believers as well. And he says this, and I quote, as both a saint and a sinner, the psalmist seems both delighted and troubled by God's constant presence. And we must be thinking, right, about ourselves with sober judgment, church. We don't just ignore our sins and take them lightly while looking at everybody else's and pointing out every, all the sin out there and, and just pridefully just, uh, the world is just going down in flames. It's such a mess out there and we just never think about our own sin. That's a prideful, haughty, terrible witness and it's showing something in your heart that you're just missing something clearly that's revealed in scripture. We must agree with God that we are imperfect sinners, and not only admit it, but like David here, we should invite the kind of intimate examination of God in our lives so that we can have our sinful intentions exposed because Christians, believers, know how complicated the depths of sin and evil can be even in our own hearts. We're honest about that, Because of the fall in the flesh, we don't ignore that. We see that. We see our sin clearer than we should. We should see our sin clearer than we're seeing sin all over the place because we live with ourselves every single day. Are you honest like that? Are you humble like that? Do you have a realization like that? Now, we might be a little frightened at the sight of God's all-knowing and all-present situation, but then we, we sober up even if we fear a little bit in that sense, and we can realize that we have the grace and mercy and forgiveness of God in Christ, that we are fully forgiven. And and we know that these truths are so important to us, and a few of these other truths were hammered home to the kids this past week in VBS. Um, Not only did we talk about how they were created special image bearers of God, but just like the murderer King David We are all born in sin and guilt and we have much sin and guilt in our lives because of our our sin and we are all guilty before God. So we looked around the room, the kids looked around the room and this is true for us. Not only am I made special, created in God's image, but I'm also guilty before a holy God. It's true of David, it's true of you, everyone in this room, whether you believe it or not, it's true of you. Even if you think about everybody else's sin and even if you watch the news and just think about all the bad things that are going outside out there, there are some bad things going on inside here as well and we need to be honest by it. Just as the kids said, I'm guilty, I want us to be aware that we are guilty as well. But then I closely uh, was encouraging them with the reality In light of that bad news of our sin and guilt, there's also the good news that we can also be forgiven. We can be forgiven. We're guilty, but we can be forgiven. So I want to say it. We talked about being created wonderfully. I want you to look to your right and left left, and tell your neighbor, tell each other that you can be forgiven. You can be forgiven. You can be forgiven. This is true for all of us. And if you're a Christian, you are forgiven. So if you know someone's a believer, you could say, you are forgiven right now, forgiven in Jesus. We don't have to pretend as forgiven believers that we have it all together. We were forgiven for a reason. Why? Because of our sin and guilt. Who are we kidding when we just ignore that and pretend that it's not there? We can and should admit to God and to one another the ways that we fail and fall. That's why it's good for us to have a humble posture among even people here in this church, people who we know and love and care for, 
we should have people that we trust speaking into our lives and encouraging us, challenging us when they see us slipping and falling into sin. We should expect that kind of thing. Why? Because we're humbled. We, we want to be changing. We want to be growing. We want God to inspect us, and we want to be growing and, and be honest about it and be continually daily repenting to our wives and husbands and, and children and and, and, and fellow church members, are you doing that? Are you humbly letting people speak into your life and speaking into others' lives because you know that you're not this perfect person who has it all together, but somebody who needs help, prayer, growth throughout your whole Christian life, wanting to expose your every evil way, every hypocritical way, every wrong intention, so that you could notice it now and change from it now for the good of other people for your own good, for the glory of God. So let's do that now. Don't wait. Don't wait till next week. Examine yourself now. Ask God to search you. Search me, O God. Search me like David asked to be searched. Since did you know that God gets the glory when he exposes our sin and he turns us to grow and mature and be humble Christians, self-aware of the reality and the mess that we could sometimes get ourselves into? This is the Christian life, to be sure. A life of repentance, as Luther helpfully put it. And even Luther says that we are simultaneously at the same time both sinners and saints, guilty due to actual sin, but also forgiven due to an actual Savior who really did justify us and forgive us as we learn from our Galatians series. So why are we hiding and pretending so much? Why do we not let anybody else in? Why are we not praying to God with this kind of searching examination? Why God to come in and search if there be any evil way in you? Why? Why don't we like honest feedback? Why do we push away from that? And ask yourself this, do you really want God to examine your heart? Do you really want other people to speak into your life? And if that's true of you, if you're a Christian and that's there, that is such a good reality and evidence that you are a child of God because that is what Christians do. We are honest. We're honest with our family, with our kids, with our spouse, with our fellow church members, with our God first and foremost, right? Because if we aren't honest like that and we're not asking God to search us, ah, we're acting more like an unbeliever, prideful. Everybody else has a problem and I don't. That's a kind of prideful heart that it's, it's exposing. Unbelief, lack of gratitude for the grace of God in your life. May that not be you. And if God already sees the every grievous way in us, we should be working those things out and seeking to identify what they are and seeking to grow because Jesus has purchased for us forgiveness of sins, but then also this transformation of life. And to be clear here, really, really clear, we don't have a transformed life and turn and repent in order to get made right before God and to get justified or forgiven by God. That's not how, when, I, when we look around and say, you can be forgiven, the answer is not do a bunch of good works, just be a really good person, <laughs> check the lists of all the things. No, that's not the answer. But the reality is, if you are a forgiven, justified child of God by grace through faith in the gospel, then you will Now have eyes to the examination of your own heart and you will plead with God to search you and to show and you will be honest with others. You're gonna be a kind of humble person who knows and sees the gospel, who loves what you've been forgiven from and how you're being transformed, who will be honest and humble and seeking to follow the lead of our great and wonderful God who shows us the way to go, who exposes in us areas that we need to repent. So that we're not just confronting everybody in this prideful way, but that we're seeing in ourselves ways that we need to grow. And this is such an appropriate place for us to close here in this sermon. Having begun thinking about the presence of God or the famous Latin Reformation phrase, as it puts it, remember the quorum Deo, I want us to close in this reality, the searching nature of God, before the seeing eye of God, the humility that that brings. I want to leave us with the clear words on this topic from R.C. Sproul, the late R.C. Sproul on this topic. And he says this, Coram Deo captures the essence of the Christian life. The phrase literally refers to something that takes place in the presence of or before the face of God. 
To live quorum Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. To live in the presence of God is to understand that whatever we are doing and wherever we are going and wherever we're doing it, we are acting under the gaze of God. God is omnipresent. There is no place so remote that we can escape his penetrating gaze. To be aware of the presence of God is also to be acutely aware of his sovereignty. The uniform experience of the saints is to recognize that if God is God, then he is indeed sovereign. And living under divine sovereignty involves more than a reluctant submission to sheer sovereignty that is motivated out of fear of punishment. It involves recognizing that there is no higher goal than offering honor to God. Our lives are to be living sacrifices, oblations offered in the spirit of adoration and gratitude. So let us all live quorum Deo, church. As Psalm 139 has reminded us, wonderful knowledge, wonderful presence, wonderful creation, fearful creation, fearful judgment, and fearful repentance before the presence of God, quorum Deo. For the glory of God, quorum Deo and to uphold the value and dignity and sanctity of all human life for all human beings from from conception to death, quorum Deo, quorum Deo, quorum Deo, fearfully and wonderfully made, quorum Deo. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that you are here with us and for us. We know that you're present with us. We live before your gaze. Help us all to be aware of that. Help us live in light of that. Let it change our thinking and living and feeling and doing. Let it make a difference in our lives. Help us not to be ignorant of the fact that you're there, the fact that you're sovereign. Help that to bring us comfort, oh God. What you've revealed to us in this single psalm is too glorious for us to behold. We're thankful for your presence, your, your beauty, your amazing majesty. Oh Lord, we're thankful for your wonderful creation. And we all confess that you are a wonderful God. And we say this in Christ's name, amen. We'll now 